thank the organizers for inviting me to this meeting. Um, when, when I got the, the invitation, I thought in presenting something that could be simple enough to be able to, in some way, quantify uncertainties. And I chose the system that is a collision between a fully strip beryllium and hydrogen. And I'm going to show some uh, results of uh, charge change for this particular system. Uh, the scope of this presentation, the, the order, I will start with a brief introduction, some, uh, a, again, brief description of the computational methods, uh, some numerical results, and a brief summary again. Well, electron capture reactions that are <coughs> sometimes called charge change reactions are those where an ion collide with a hydrogen, in this case, an atom, uh, to produce hydrogen plus and have usually highly excited ion. These cross sections for this particular process are required in plasma modeling and then diagnostics. And in this talk, I am going to talk about a simple system because it's a one electron system. This is much more easy in principle than uh, Tom's presentation. Um, I chose also beryllium because this is especially re relevant in fusion. Uh, uh, previous work on beryllium, I, I am going to use many data from previous calculations. There are no experimental data at all for beryllium, so we have no comparison with experiments. And the, there is a need for of theoretical data. And they, these data have been produced for more than 35 years. And the accuracy of this calculation is, let's say, doubtful. For example, uh, I am going to use my own work in this case. Uh, this is an old paper uh, we wrote in 1982. Um, we calculated charge change cross-section for beryllium 4 plus on hydrogen. But you can see this work. Uh, this, the, the calculation includes only three molecular states. But we were so brave that we gave numerical results. And also, we produced results for an energy as high as 36 keV, that means a velocity of 1.2 uh, atomic units. I must say that the, the answer is not so bad. The, the, the results are not bad. But this is the kind of calculation that we are doing this time. Um, I am going to pass now to the situation now. Um, there are many calculations. I started a few of them to produce this graph. Probably I've forgotten some of them. Um, there are molecular calculations. There are atomic calculations. And I chose a couple of them, those <coughs> from uh, Igenberg, the most recent one, and the calculation by Toshima. It's a classic one. And um, also I used um, the molecular calculations of uh, Adele and co-workers. And a couple of uh, CTMC calculations. The range of energies I am going to talk about is in between 1 and 100 kV. Uh, so I am going to concentrate, to focus on three particular energies to show numerical results. So let's say low energy, uh, 1 kV, uh, intermediate energy, 30 kV per, per U, and high energy, that is 100 kV per U. Uh, in this talk, so I am going to discuss only results in this energy range between 1 and 100. So as uh, Tom said before, the semi-classical method is, uh, let's say, exact. So I am mm, just concentrate on semi-classical calculations. I am going to discuss the uncertainties of unpartial cross-sections. So I am not going to uh, consider L. NL partial cross section, only N partial cross sections. I'll discuss the accuracy and the uncertainties of CTMC results. And I'll show you some results of the numerical integration of the time dependence running equation. So, methods. First, the semi classical method is used everywhere, where the nuclei follow rectilinear trajectories and the electrons are described by means of a 
uh, we find so that this solution of this semi-classical equation that formally is the same as the time dependent Schrodinger equation, where the uh, electronic Hamiltonian includes the electron interaction with both the projectile are, in this case, uh, the target nuclei, both are simple Coulomb potentials. First kind of methods are molecular orbital expansions, where the solution of the time dependent Schrodinger equation is developed in terms of molecular orbitals, which are solutions of the fixed nuclei uh, Bohr-Oppenheimer Schrodinger equation and well, a common transmission factor is also included in the expansion in order to fulfill the uh, initial condition of the collision. At higher energies, uh, the most common uh, expansion is an atomic one. In this case, the basis functions are uh, target and projectile atomic orbitals, in this case multiplied by plane wave transition factors, and this is the expansion that is called AOCC in my presentation. In practice, the computational procedure involves the calculation of couplings, the solution of that differential equation for the coefficients of the expansion, and from these coefficients, you can calculate transition probabilities and a total cross-section. I say that the uncertainties involved in these calculations, the couplings, the solution to differential equations, the uncertainty due to the different choices of the final time in the integration and the final B, and also the grid of impact parameters, in general, I, I would say that they are not relevant. So, uh, in general, calculation has been done in such a way that the, the incidence of these uh, choices is not uh, sensi sensi uh, important. Um, so I am going to just focus on the convergence of the uh, different expansions. Uh, second oh, type of methods that have been used in general at higher energies are those based on the classical trajectory Monte Carlo method. Again, I am assuming that the nuclei are called <coughs> rectilinear trajectories, and now the electronic motion is described by a classical distribution function. Um, in practice, this involves the solution of a set of Hamilton e equations for the different electronic trajectories, and after the integration is carried out, we have to distinguish between the different processes uh, involved. For example, we have to look at the energy of the electron is negative with respect to the target and the projectile is negative with respect to the target and positive with respect to the projectile and so on. In the case of capture, the uh, trajectory is said to be a capture trajectory if the energy of the electron is positive with respect to the target and negative with respect to the projectile. Um, one important point, okay, this is the application, again, a calculation of transition probabilities <coughs> and cross-section is similar to the case of close coupling methods. Um, also, M partial and NL partial cross-section can be calculated using the recipe of Baker and McKellar, where the classical phase space is divided into different spaces in order to evaluate how many trajectories get into each box of those. With this in mind, I am uh, going to comment briefly one of the difficulties in applying the CTMC method, that is the initial distribution that is used. The, let's say, a standard decision is to use a microcanonical uh, di distribution where all trajectories, they have the same energy, the energy there. So okay. it's here, it's one, minus one half. So all they have the same energy. Uh, it's known, it's well known, that this distribution, if we plot the uh, spatial and, I'm not able to manage with this. Okay. It's a good value, the, the direction. There you go. Okay, thank you. <laughs> the, um, a momentum distribution is exact. If you look here, the microcanonical and the quantile distribution, they are exactly the same. 
but the radial distribution it has a mm, cutoff at uh, r equal to atomic units that corresponds to those trajectories that are not classically allowed. So this is the classically forbidden region of the quantum distribution. Uh, in order to solve this difficulty, there have been some ideas of suggesting different initial distribution. I consider one of those, that is the classical Hardy and Olson hydrogenic distribution, that is a linear combination of several uh, microcanonical ones with different energies. I, when I plot the same figure as before, here now I have the microcanonical, the hydrogenic, and the quantum distribution. There is a, a small difference when using the hydrogenic distribution in the momentum distribution, but now the uh, feeding procedure makes a almost a sad uh, a special distribution. In the following, I am going to show you results obtained with this particular distribution, the hydrogenic one. Finally, there are a fourth type of methods that have been applied to uh, handle this problem, which are the numerical integration methods. Uh, there are a classical paper of Mirami and uh, collaborators that use this method that is called lattice time dependent Schrodinger equation, in which they solve numerically the, the, the time dependent Schrodinger equation. And we have carried out a few calculations using a modification of a program called GRID TDSE. And this is a code in it originally de developed for using in molecular dynamics that uh, we have uh, adapted. Essentially, my colleague uh, Jaime Suarez has adapted to be used for atomic collisions. And I am going to show some results in the sense that have an extra comparison between different methods for the same cross section. Uh, in this uh, method, we solve the Rödinger equation using a numerical procedure. In practice, the one difficulty is. Uh, the integration of the Coulomb's singularity. So in practice, we used a soft core procedure where the real potential are substituted by these soft core versions. This parameter is of the order of uh, 1, 10 to minus 3 atomic units. And in practice, it's something that has been chosen depending on the grid of points using in the, using the calculation. Um, the wave function is evaluated in a grid of points. Uh, I'll show you some results for three of those grids with different number of points and different uh, extension. Uh, one problem with the use of these numerical methods is the use, of the, the, the problem of reflections in the limits of the box where the wave function is defined. So we need a potential to absorb the, the flux going into the, the, the border of this box. And we have used one of those mask functions to remove all these flux. So we have, uh, in this method, a couple of details uh, to take into account the, the number of points in the grid, the absorbing potential, and the soft core potential, which are some uh, possible sources of an uncertainty in this kind of calculation. Uh, well, this is too detailed. I am going to show you some results. These are charge exchange cross sections calculated at the low energy part of my graph, 1 kV per U. And this is the partial cross section to form beryllium 3 plus on n equal 3. Oh, it should be, sorry about this, this is to be H plus, of course. Uh, I am afraid that this has been cut and paste everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, the, the, these are the numbers I got from several calculations. The molecular orbital calculation we ran uh, several years ago. Uh, <laughs> the 17 basis means that the, the basis set in the molecular calculation includes 17 states. That is the minimal basis for this particular calculation. 
Uh, this is a, a, let's say, standard basis, and this almost the same basis from two different publications. Um, these are the results of uh, the numerical integration and the atomic orbital calculation. I would say that at this low energy, the reference is given by the molecular orbital calculation. So the, an estimate of the uncertainty could be the difference between these two numbers, 30 30, 34, 7, and 34, 4. That is a the difference between the minimal and the standard basis. This looks uh, rather sensible because the, the atomic orbital large calculation uh, lies in between these two bounds. And the numerical integration, although the, the grid is not very high, it is very dense, I would say that it's also in, in, of the same order. Uh, the, at this low energy, the only levels that are populated are this one, N3 and N4. Uh, for N equal 4, the difference between the uh, small and large basis set is already higher. So I would say that this number, 2.4, is not a reference because this is essentially the minimal basis set. So in order to estimate the accuracy, the, sorry, the precision of this calculation, I would need uh, another calculation in between these two, the 70 and the 96 calculation. Again, the agreement with the other calculation is, is rather good. Let's go to higher energies. This is the second line in my first graph, 30 kV per year. In this plot, I represented the Cross, partial cross-section for populating different ends in two calculations, the uh, numerical one and the atomic orbital loss coupling calculation. These are the data of Ikenberg again, and they have been obtained with a basic set of 170 atomic orbitals, including zero states. Uh, again, I would need something to estimate the uncertainty of this atomic orbital calculation. Uh, the, the authors of this calculation, they run a few calculations with different bases, but they only presented some results of total cross-section. So this uh, uncertainty estimate is based on the difference between the total cross-section evaluated using a basic set of if I remember, 120 atomic orbitals, and another one that is the largest basis of 170 that include uh, several zero states. So I would say that, again, this could give an estimate of the uncertainty of the atomic orbital calculation of about 0.4 squared angstroms. Uh, another example, this is the next uh, uh, partial cross-section, uh, that is, again, something that could be estimated, the uncertainty in about uh, 0.4 as square astrons. If I go to higher energy, the situation is mm, much more difficult. Here I compare calculations, atomic orbital calculation, the classical trajectory, Monte Carlo, and the numerical. The first conclusion from this plot is that the atomic, atomic orbital calculation is accumulating some flux in the excited levels. So it's reflecting that the basis is probably not complete enough to describe the charge exchange at these energies. Uh, the other two methods, they give a uh, let's say, reasonably comparison. And I'm going to copy some numbers. Let's uh, first idea about the uh, precision of the classical trajectory in Monte Carlo could be to consider calculations where we include different number of trajectories. In particular, here you have a calculation with 10 to 5 and 5 tenths times 10 to 5 trajectories, and 
you can see that the <coughs> difference is not very high. So again, we have some uh, uh, ideas of how to quantify the certainty of this particular calculation by comparing results with different number of trajectories. If I look at the grid calculation, uh, this is a, a bit preliminary, but it's a, an indication of the precision of this calculation. We run calculation with different uh, grids, including uh, more points and, and a larger extension of the grid. The orange line here, it corresponds to the grid that is uh, less, less uh, smaller. This is the smallest one. Um, you can see that it's unable to describe the transition probability to high end levels. The other three grids, uh, sorry, the, the three, these are from 30 to, uh, so the minus 30 to 30, minus 40 to 40, are similar in, the, they have the same uh, density, the distance between adjacent points is the same, and essentially we obtain the same answer. So when the grid is able to reproduce a given uh, uh, atomic level, the, the precision of the calculation is independent on, on the uh, extent of this grid. It depends only on the density of the grid. And there are some indications that the uh, differences between different results when we change the grid density, like here, the green points corresponds to a grid with a, uh, a smaller density. Um, going to the numerical comparison, they are the partial cross-section for populating n equal 3, the same result. Uh, n equal 4 and n equal 5, that some difference is uh, n equal 5 that they are I, honestly, I don't understand very well which the, the reason of this discrepancy. But again, the uh, uncertainty could be related or not with the statistical uh, uh, accuracy of the calculation in the classical method. But I am going to show you something else. A, I show the results for n, n equal 3, 4, 5. What happens at, for n equal 2? Here you can see a difference between atomic orbitals and CTMC and grid. Uh, but here the, the classical trajectory calculation is giving us something higher than the other results. And this could point to a, another difficulty. This could be something like a systematic error of the calculation. Um, to quantify the systematic difficulty of this particular calculation, I include here a similar calculation using the, let's say, classical distribution, the standard one, the microcanonical. The, this, there is an overpopulation everywhere. Over here, everywhere you have, uh, let's say, less accurate calculation. But for the particular case of n equal to, the result yeah, obtained using the microcanonical is almost the same as the result we obtained with the grid calculation. Um, this is something that, let's say, is uh, probably known in the field. And it's the fact that when we use a hydrogenic distribution, we put some extra trajectories with energy higher than 0.5. But to compensate those trajectories, we have to include trajectories with energy less than minus 0.5. So we have many trajectories with low energy, and these are responsible for this uh, additional uh, cross-section for n equal to. Uh, trying again to quantify the uncertainty. No problems with the number of trajectories in the microcanonical and the difference with the grid calculation is now smaller. So th this is something that should be taken into account with, when using CTMC calculation. Uh, I go back to the very first 
plot of my talk, the total cross section. And I'd like to show you what is happening here at 100 kb, where the dispersion of results is clear. There are results, uh, all calculations here and there. So it looks that there are two sets of calculations, the CTMC and the atomic orbital calculations, which give a larger cross-section, and the other ones which give a, a smaller cross-section. Uh, to understand this difference, I brought here an extended graph of the partial cross-sections as a function of the final quantum number. The atomic orbital calculation, it shows a uh, let's say a physical increase here. The other calculation here, the black line uh, that is continued by the green line is the classical result. And the grid is, it stops at uh, n equal 8 because of the exten extension of the grid precludes to go to higher n. If we include the calculation, the grid calculation, by extrapolating from n equal to 8 to infinity using the CTMC result, I would obtain something like this. Oh, sorry. This is the numerical results taking into account only until n equal 8. Adding the contribution of very excited and levels, I go to the uh, classical result. So I would say that this is the most accurate results I could obtain. Something obtain it using, in this case, the CTMC calculation. Uh, in order to quantify this, I go back to the numbers. For the total cross-section, I have from the hydrogenic calculation with two sets of trajectories, something like 3.13, 3.14. The extrapolation using the gas, <coughs> it goes to 309. That is really similar. And in order to give an estimate of the asymptotes associated to this number, 3.13, I would include the uncertainty that comes from the statistics of the calculation, the number of trajectories include, and also the differences due to the systematic error, due to the, let's say, wrong description of n equal to. So this estimate is made by taking the difference between the hydrogenic and microcanonical distribution. And it gives a, as a total something like 10 to minus 1 for the total cross-section at this uh, high energy. So I would end with a few tentative conclusions on this. Uh, I would say that at low energies, we can estimate less <coughs> easily the uncertainty of the partial cross-sections by taking into account the convergence of the molecular orbital calculation. Something similar for the atomic orbital. In that case, we have not many uh, numerical data, but we can estimate in something similar. At high energies, the, we can use the CTMC calculation. It has a small uncertainty from the number of trajectories included in the, in the calculation, but we had to take into account the difficulties of describing the low end levels. And finally, the preliminary results on the numerical method uh, points out that the precision is function of the, essentially, of the grid density. Um, some outlook. And if I go to uh, l low energies, uh, I should use a quantum treatment. So this is a different problem. And probably we have to take care about the number of partial weight includes in the calculation. And obviously, if 
low energy collisions and many lift resistance, the precision of the basic function is the key point and this is something much more difficult. Well, I finish with the co-workers of the group. Um, you probably know some of them. And I have some time for a commercial. <laughs> commercial. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, this is to remind you that it, it will take place in Toledo, in Spain, next year. So thank you very much. <laughs>